Hello and welcome to the Skewgaw Chamber of Commerce Show. My guest today is Chief Kelly LaRocca, who heads up the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation. We'll learn all about the functionality of the MSIFN and what it means to be chief. We're also going to explore the story behind Chief LaRocca and learn what challenges she faces on a regular basis. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Ian Mose, the operations manager for the GTA East for Enbridge Gas, the sponsor of today's show. Thank you, Jonathan. On behalf of Enbridge, I'm proud to be a member of the Skugog Chamber of Commerce and pleased to have the opportunity to address your business community today. In case you're not familiar with Enbridge Gas, on the surface we may look like a natural gas distribution company, and in many ways we are, powering the quality of life for 3.8 million Ontarians using low carbon natural gas is something of which we are quite proud and will continue to support for some time. However, in many ways, we are better represented as an energy company, one that is dedicated to achieving net zero emissions in our own operations by 2050 and helping communities across Ontario do the same while still providing affordable and reliable natural gas to power the quality of life for the people and businesses of Skugog. Businesses are an essential component of a strong local economy and affordable energy helps businesses compete and thrive in the marketplace. Enbridge Gas is here today and we will be there tomorrow to deliver the energy people need and want, however that looks, to help ensure communities we serve are sustainable and prosperous. Today's guest was an advocate for expanding natural gas to Skugog Island, helping to support and advance the community's development and well-being. Chief Kelly LaRocco serves as the chief of the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation and her leadership in helping to bring energy, reliability and affordability to the residents of Skugog demonstrates that we can be responsible environmental stewards. Look forward to today's program and hearing all about Chief Laraka and the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation. Thank you for this opportunity to address the Skugog Chamber of Commerce. Miigwech. So Chief Laraka, welcome. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you, Jonathan. So I've got a lot of uh, questions that I wanted to ask you, but a lot of people, a lot of our, our viewers are not overly familiar with uh, with what the Mississaugas as a nation do. They, they obviously know that, that you folks exist and have for many, many years, but as far as, as the actual functionality and, and the organization itself. So if you don't mind, we could just dig a little bit into that, if that's okay with you. Sure. So you're comprised of a council, and how many councillors do you have? Currently we have a council of three people. Okay. Including the chief. Including the chief. So as chief, do you have your own jurisdiction as well, like your own area, or are you, just, you in, in charge of everything, so to speak? We have a base of uh, constituent citizens, yes, mm -hmm. who some of whom reside on the First Nation territory, right. and then others reside across the world. We have a member in Hawaii. Oh, really? We have members, a pretty big family uh, contingent of members who are out in uh, Vancouver area. Okay. And um, many who are in uh, Niagara, Fort Erie area as well as Toronto. I did not know yeah. that. Yeah, so it so makes for interesting community consultation. I can imagine. <laughs> so you must have a vast network of, of <clears throat> email and newsletters and, and things like that to, to spread the word. Indeed. And these people are all eligible to vote regardless of where they reside? Yes, 18 okay. plus, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and what is the population of, of the... Um, the Mississaugas? Overall, we're uh, 250 members. Okay. Uh, we have, I believe, in and around 71 members and their families living in the community. All right. And yeah. you have elections every two years? Correct? Yes. And you've been mayor now, for, mayor, sorry, you've been chief now for uh, 2013? Since 2013, okay. yes. And I know that was a, a, a slip, but the job of chief is similar to the job of mayor, isn't it? More or less as far as the that's an interesting uh, debate. Personally, I think it's um, quite different in many ways and very similar in other ways. So like a mayor, you have a constituency of people you're responsible to and you serve. You have a certain land base that you cover insofar as your jurisdictional right. area is concerned. You offer programs and services to the community. Um, and you have infrastructure as well that you are concerned with and economic development. Right. But um, I'd say the role of chief or and member of council is slightly different from a mayor in council as we consider ourselves a, a government. We're not a creation of any um, 
province or statute. We are um, a, a cultural community, a, a nation, if you will. So you'll hear the word Mississauga, the term Mississauga Nation applied to us because we are a part of a larger uh, cultural uh, group, the Mississauga Nation. We um, have our own language, obviously, and culture. And so as a member of uh, council, you are a community leader, you are also a, a cultural leader in the sense that you have to always maintain an open doorway for your citizens to access culture because of course due to the residential schools experience and other colonial efforts, our people have had a loss of culture and have to um, re-engage with culture in the ways we feel comfortable and at, at any given time. So there's that role. You're also an advocate, so often going to court or lobbying uh, for your community, and I guess that's similar in many ways to uh, municipal style governance, but it's also really quite similar to provincial governance as well. And right. So I, I, I see First Nations service in government as being um, kind of unique and of its own kind. You're also lobbying on a much larger scale than a, a municipal government uh, because you've got an entire um, country, really, that, that you, you more or less represent So with what you say and do. It's interesting because there are two streams of lobbying. One is, you know, obviously we're, we're meeting a lot with the, the municipal government, the right. provincial government, and the federal government. But on the other hand, we have political tribal organizations with whom we right. lobby and are, are um, grouped with in terms of lobbying efforts. So the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Mississauga Nation, the Chiefs of Ontario, and the Assembly of First Nations all the right. way up that chain too. With, with common goals, which, yes. which have to be. Yes, trying to yeah. seek them out, yes. <laughs> So this is really a full-time job for you. There, there's no uh, there's no spare time here at all. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Kelly LaRocca prior to, to being uh, the chief. So you were born in Oshawa. You have a brother and your parents moved to Port Perry when you were 16 years old. Yes. Which, which is great. Now, interesting, your dad was a jazz musician. And I found that very, very interesting. <laughs> I believe he did a stint at General Motors too, but he was a jazz musician. Right. Well, he was he was a full time uh, person at General Motors and, okay. and retired there after after I think thirty five or thirty seven years. Okay. Um, but he yes he was a jazz musician first and foremost. And your brother is as well, right? <laughs> yes, that is his full time gig. Okay. So is this this is the point where I ask what instrument do you play? Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I I played the saxophone for a little bit, uh, alto sax, and I was pretty terrible. But my brother yeah. he was gifted with the musical nice. Nice genius. Yeah. Nice. The name La Rocca does not, in my mind, sound very Ojibwe. So, it is not. <laughs> so what is, the, what is the connection there, if I could ask? So Laraka is my, uh, my father's name, okay. so my dad's side, and uh, from Italy, and right. uh, so he's, uh, he's an Italian-Canadian, uh, and so am I. Um, so I decided to keep that name when I was married to right. my husband, Jonathan Laraka, and he, uh, very proudly and uh, progressively ended up taking our family name because he felt it was important to right. uh, carry on that tradition because my uh, my brother is is uh, is a musician and he's a single guy and will be forever right uh, but he uh, uh, so he supported me in, in keeping that name and I nice I, I proudly nice. keep it yeah that's wonderful that's mm -hmm. wonderful especially from your ch children's perspective too, exactly I'm sure yeah that, that's great um, I mentioned earlier before we went on the air that, that one of the first times we met was at the Canada Day operations or Canada Day um, festivities in, in Skugog and your, your son Eli was three weeks old and I know you had to do a presentation. I remember seeing you walk up to the gazebo with him sort of strapped to the front and, and um, you, were, you were a little bit frazzled because there was a lot going on but you pulled it off very well and it was, it was just so cute to see. So. Uh, and I guess he's four now, so. Eli's four mm -hmm. and Ruby, my daughter, is uh, seven this April. Wow. And throughout my tenure as chief, um, well, I had my children during my tenure as chief and they attended work with me pretty much the entire time, traveling to all kinds of indigenous uh, related meetings and, and of course to Ottawa. And um, yeah, it was the best exposure for them and uh, the best way for me to raise them. <laughs> And they call you chief, do they, at home? No. No, okay. <laughs> no, Ruby's the chief at home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so it should be. So, Chief, I, I understand that your mother moved to Port Perry because the Mississaugas at that time wanted to uh, open up a, a venue where they could sell the arts and the crafts and the, the 
information and the things that, that about them that, with the rest of the world. And they opened a store on Queen Street in Port Perry, correct? And your mother ran that, is that? Yes, the First Nation um, Council wanted to uh, open a business called Native Perspectives, which uh, showcased the First Nation in, in the local town, and yes, tried to um, give us some public, more public profile around uh, who we are and what we do. So my mother was asked to move home and uh, run the, the store on right. the behalf of the band. Um, given that she had over you know 30 years retail experience and so okay. she came in and did that and the store ran I can't remember exactly I think it was about four years okay and uh, the First Nation decided it wasn't um, as lucrative as, as it had intended and wanted to focus its efforts elsewhere so my mom said okay well I'll buy it from you Right. So uh, she ended up uh, buying it from the First Nation, renaming it Native Focus, and then um, ran it until she passed in 2003. Okay. So and then it was taken over by, by Jeremy and Aaron LePage, LePage right? Yes. Right, who ran it for quite a while too. Um, I do know them. I, I knew Eddie LePage as well, who's a fantastic artist, just unbelievable artist. In, um, totally. So I, I assume you worked in that store without really having an option. I sure <laughs> did, you know, and it was um, it was the best experience uh, right. that I could have had as a young person. I worked for my mother actually in Oshawa as well when she sold fine ladies wear. Was that Ruby Joe's? Yes, Ruby Joe's. Ah, fashions. so that's why your daughter's named Ruby. <laughs> well, actually, yes. So so Jody uh, Smith Rodway, who's uh, a proud Port Perian, right. she. Um, was my mom's best friend, and um, she's married to John Rodway, who works right. at the butcher. Right. And uh, anyway, they her sister Ruby uh, was part owner in Ruby Joe's Fashions, and I remember when I was uh, pregnant and knew I was having a daughter, I said to Jonathan, "We have to, we have to name our daughter after someone." Formidable yet classy. Right. And then I thought of Ruby, actually, Jody's sister. So yeah. Right. That's Jonathan didn't enter into the picture at that time. He no. he really he said right. he wanted to call her Sophia. So I said, all right, well, let's wait, <laughs> let's wait until we meet her. And then he right. came to me and he said, I have something to tell you about our daughter. I said, what is it? In the hospital suite, and he, he said, she's a Ruby. Oh, I said, all isn't right. that sweet? So yeah, it that's nice. Definitely, that's fits. wonderful. <laughs> That's why you can always name the next one Jonathan, I suppose. So <laughs> two and done, two and done, moving Jonathan. right along. Two and done. <laughs> <laughs> the um, so I, I got down here that you also prune trees for for the uh, for the First Nation. Is mm -hmm. that as a as a job? So you're. Yeah, it was my summer job. Yes, right. working for the community when uh, I guess I would have been sixteen at the time. Right. They used to co-manage some uh, forests up in the uh, up in the north end of the island. Okay. So. I did that, yes. That's always fun. I mean, getting out there with nature <clears throat> for a day or two. Hey, it was, it was great, <laughs> and it, uh, it actually really made me appreciate how hard uh, maintenance people work, and right, uh, right. I had a real, a real respect for our crew, and um, yeah, yeah. work well, with I, a lot of the elders of, well, people who became the elders of the yeah. community. And I mean, I see people, on, I come in early in the morning sometimes, and I see people you know, from, from the township, working the grounds like at seven o'clock in the morning sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a tough job. Yeah, it is, it is, it's, it's backbreaking. And uh, especially during COVID time, right? When, when oh. a lot of people aren't working and available and you still gotta keep the, the machine moving as it were, so. Absolutely, yeah. they kept us running through the whole pandemic and we're part right. of our essential services, so, yeah. So you wanted to get into law, you said. Um, so. You, you went on to, to get a, an honors Bachelor of Arts in philosophy. So I assume you're analyzing everything I'm saying now. Absolutely. Good, good, and it's all gray. <laughs> There's no, no black and white here. So you went to Windsor Law School. I did. And received a degree. What type of law did you uh, specialize in? Uh, civil litigation. Okay, and that, was, that would be in Toronto, right? For, yes. for a big law firm kind of thing. And you did graduate work in the University of Victoria in BC? I did, I went out and took some specialty courses in okay. Aboriginal law. How long were you out there? Uh, I guess I was out there from 2005 until 2007. Okay, I love it out there, I love Victoria. <laughs> it's just a beautiful part it's of the world. Absolutely yeah. stunning, yeah. Absolutely. So you were working on your thesis, you were living in uh, Waterloo at the time, and you heard of a by-election with the Mississaugas of Skugog Township and said, hey, this is for me. Well, yes, there was a notice of a by-election from our First Nation, and um, 
it uh, just came in the mail and I thought my life was transitioning at the time and um, my father kind of needed me at the time and I thought I, sh I should consider that and move closer right. to home and actually apply the courses that I learned yeah. <laughs> in Aboriginal law. And um, it was great because I, I felt I needed to reconnect and, and be closer to family and so it, it right. actually was perfect timing. And you're living in your ancestral home, right? Yes, it's so. my mother's house. Wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's actually quite comforting on some level because yeah, I, I can know imagine it would be. She's always around. Yeah. And so, you you became a councillor in two thousand and eight, and you became mayor or sorry chief in twenty thirteen. Yes. And so you were just reelected recently, right? It was just last fall, was it? Yes, last year? summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so you're gonna do this for the next 25, 30 years if they'll have you kind of thing? Is that if the they'll have me, okay. if they'll have me. You obviously enjoy it, right? I do. Yeah. So I've, I've, got a, I've got a note here, it's an interesting story about how you, you met your husband because you know, I'm, I'm, the obvious question is did you meet him either through law or did you meet him through, through your careers and that, but that wasn't quite the case, right? No. <laughs> how did you meet him? No, I um well, I was serving the community at the time and, and living alone, and I thought, gosh, I, I'm working a little too much. I probably should interact a little more with the outside world. <laughs> so I ended up um, taking some dance lessons. I was supposed to go to a, a wedding with a date, right. this gentleman who had asked me to go, and I thought I better brush up on my dance steps because I knew that fellow was a good dancer. Right. So I enrolled in a class in Oshawa and um, it was a group class uh, full of ladies and then after that were private lessons. And so I did the group class and we were all shuffling out and I looked down the hall and I saw this fellow signing some papers at the front desk and I thought, uh-oh, he might be my dance teacher. <laughs> and apparently he was watching the ladies shuffle out of the class and saw me and said, oh, let it be her. <laughs> so anyway, we had some dance lessons and uh, yes, I married my dance teacher. He literally swept you off your feet. He did. That's wonderful. That's, <laughs> so do you still go dancing a lot? Well, we usually dance at home now because yeah. of course the kids are little. But. Yeah, <laughs> I, did, I did take ballroom dancing. Um, and and some, sometimes you just learn that some things are just not meant to be. And that was my, that was the case. <laughs> that was the way it was. I have two left feet. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, as chief, now, so what what would your duties be on a on a, like an, a thirty thousand foot level? Um, well, I I do a lot of lobbying. Okay. So going to Queens Park, going to Ottawa, right? On any number of issues. Uh, I meet with the other um, groups of chiefs through the other political tribal organizations quite often. So the, there's a lobbying and advocacy portion of it. So I, I'm often in court for various things, whether it's a gaming related matter or right. say, a, say a child welfare dispute or um, a treaty issue. Uh, I also do a lot of negotiations, so um, I was part of the negotiations team for the Williams Treaties okay. settlement in 2018 and uh, of course took part in the, the gaming uh, negotiations in 2016 for the Great Blue Heron. Um, so you know there's a huge advocacy portion of right. it all. There's a lot of um, public figurehead work that you have to do, making appearances here and there, going on the news and things like that. Um, there's a cultural aspect to the job, as I mentioned. You are a cultural leader, and you have to make sure that there's there's a lot of pressure for our people to feel rushed to nation build. And when you're when you're trying to build an economy and tend to all the urgent issues that affect First Nations, you feel pressure from the outside world right. to just right. hurry up and get it done. Right. So I feel I often feel like I'm trying to give my people space to right. enjoy language, culture, and cultural revitalization. So that's part of it, is trying to um, always keep an open doorway for that for your people on their time. And um, of You're course- You're also dealing with, with the day-to-day things that happen with, with people, just a normal, like my yes. room's got potholes <laughs> in it or, or that yep. kind of stuff, right? Yeah, the so. constituency complaints about programs, services, infrastructure, right. um, community meetings. We do a lot of uh, community consultation. I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, yeah. I meet, uh, 
I meet with our people usually once or twice a month in okay. the evenings on topics that we're needing their consultation about. So whether it's land use planning or or um, an election uh, right. revamp or whatever, we uh, engage our people that way. But we also have quarterly open unagended council meetings really? where I um, just get up and answer whatever my people want to know. And usually it's about four hours long. And uh, Wonderful. we do that four times a year, so I'm, that, that's, I'm pretty proud of that. That's very important because a lot of times politicians lose touch with their constituents, right? They just, they, they assume they know what they want, what the people want, and they kind of roll and time goes by and next thing you know you're on to two different uh, wavelengths. So that's, True. that's good that you do that. And that's open to any any members of, of the Mississaugas? Yes, any band member, whether on or off the territory. We okay. have them, yesterday we had a meeting, for example, that was both virtual and in person. Right. It would be nice to eliminate the virtual for a while. Oh yeah. boy, but know. you know, we have such great participation that way that I don't want to, uh, from our community's perspective anyway, because right. it, it just, it allows so many people to take part. That's true. I mean, you can always, you can do both with no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do miss the virtual a little bit myself because <clears throat> the, the live show is in 4K and that doesn't do anything for the, uh, the features on the face. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> for me anyways. <laughs> So let's, I wanted to talk about the casino a little bit because obviously we know there's, there's the Great Blue Heron Casino, but that hasn't always been there. It's been like, what, 15, 18? Years? Since 1997. So it's been a while. I'll do the math later. Over so, 25. So how did that come about? Do you, do you know, like, do you, how did that come about? Yeah, I'd say it's a pretty proud history of our community. Uh, Gary Edgar, my uncle, who was right. chief at the time, and uh, his council, um, heard through the economic development grapevine that the NDP government at the time was putting forward gaming opportunities for First Nations okay. and uh, wanted to proliferate some level of gaming in the province. Um, but there was a lot of public backlash, and so people didn't want it in their backyards. Right. And First Nations saw it as an opportunity to host uh, gaming facilities. It did involve for us giving up a third of our territory to okay. the casino, um, which is hard when you're a small First Nation. Yeah. But um, we took a chance and we thought, okay, we need to find a gaming partner, get, uh, well at the time it was a bingo and, and uh, tables hall. Right and uh, the OLG did not have their slots in. And so it was a big risk for the community, a financial one, where we found a partner, uh, thanks to the chief and council of the day, and um, you know wanted to then bid on the government's process. There were two streams. We could have a commercial stream or a charitable stream. Okay. And my community 100% voted in favor of a charitable donations. And the stream. difference, the obvious difference is, is, is the charitable, the money you raise goes back into a charitable source, is that, yes. is that correct? Yes. Whereas commercial, it stays within your coffers and you build whatever, do whatever you want with it, right? That's a, yes. that's a big difference. But what I find really important to always highlight is that in 2016, when we felt we had to enter the commercial gaming space, our community continued our donations program. Really? The same as. I, I know you've given well over and 35. They don't have to. Uh, you've <laughs> given well over $35 million to the, uh, to the community, which, which is outstanding. Um, so, so y now who built the actual casino? Like, who actually paid for the casino? Who actually owned it at the so time? So, Casinos Austria and the First Nation okay. were partners at the time so and partnered. funded okay. that. Yes. So, the one thing I, that I did want to touch on in the few minutes we have left is there was a recent announcement about a one point five million dollar uh, payment that was given to the town of Skugog. Why don't you elaborate a little bit on that so we know exactly what that was was all about? So that was part of um, a way to achieve a fire roads and EMS agreement with the town uh, to service Skugog First Nation. We knew that um, the Lake Skugog enhancement project uh, for the improvement and betterment of the Port Perry waterfront was an ongoing project that required uh, quite a significant fundraise. And we had been approached by the LSEP people a right. few times to give presentations and things and try and obtain some support from the First Nation. So that was sort of going on in the background and at the, in the forefront we were, as uh, two respective governments, uh, negotiating this municipal services agreement and not having that easy of a time of it. <laughs> Um, the previous Skugog Town Council had um, indicated that if we 
did not um, come to an agreement that we would be cut off of fire services. Thankfully, the Scugog uh, Township Fire Chief uh, disagreed and, and attested he would be there along with his people in the event of an emergency. And unfortunately, that was tested. So last summer during the pandemic, uh, we experienced a major fire loss in the community and the fire chief, Chief Bernie, was there as stated. So I, I wanna honestly give the biggest shout out to him and his team and all the EMS services people that were on attendance on the site. But in the meantime, for over, I guess it was since 20, 2018, the day I gave birth to my son Eli, May 10th, I received that letter notifying the cutoff of fire service. And from that point in time up to now, uh, the First Nation and the Skugog Town Council had been sort of going to and fro, back and forth, trying to figure out what are the fire roads and EMS services actually worth. And in 2016, um, the OLG commercial deal for our casino changed the landscape for the town in the sense that um, they had to then renegotiate with the OLG what it would cost to bring services um, for the casino footprint, but then they were left with a shortfall for what it would cost to service the rest of the First Nation territory. Their economic develop or their economic experts, along with ours, each valued the problem, and we were quite far apart in how the services were valued from the municipal accounting standards. So we ended up kind of taking a breather and take you know take, take taking a step back and just um, trying to regroup because we wanted cooler heads to prevail, and certainly under this new council they have, um, new council of the town. I'm saying. Um, so Mayor, Mayor Drew, of course, had a lot to contend with during COVID, as did we. And so we kind of let it, let it simmer for a bit and came back together and thought, well, how can we think outside the box and come to an agreement? And I said, well, you know, you're obviously committed to the LSEP idea, so are we. Knowing that there's a, a fundraising ask and knowing that we couldn't give exactly what they were asking, why not tie in the two, uh, the two uh, topics? So we ended up saying, well, let's do a $1.5 million donation in exchange for, right. for uh, Fire Roads and EMS services. And that 1.5 will be directed directly to the LSEP project. And that's an upfront pro uh uh, an upfront donation, right? That's well, it, there are certain factors attributed to uh, or contingent upon starting construction and right, getting other fundraise, right. but yes. Wonderful, excellent. Mm -hmm. I'm glad it all worked out. It was, it's the first agreement of its kind and, and I'm really uh, proud to have worked with our council, uh, councillors uh, Laura Caldwell and Jeff uh, Forbes, as well as the Scugog Township uh, Council on, on, under Mayor Drew. I want to give a shout out to them and just say uh, miigwech. I think it's a great example of how First Nations and municipalities can work together to achieve common goals for the community. Right. Excellent, thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time has come to an end, which it always does, and it's always sad because it's very interesting to to listen to to <clears throat> the way that things operate and, and that, because I don't think a lot of people fully understand that. So I do appreciate that very much. Chief LaRocca, thank you so much for all of this wonderful information. Unfortunately, our time has come to an end. I'd also like to thank Enbridge Gas for their continued sponsorship of this program. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. On behalf of the Skugog Chamber of Commerce, I look forward to seeing you next time.